are going to start this episode with a reading of a tweet dated October 30th, 2014, almost three years ago. This tweet was crafted by none other than myself and uh, one of my trademark lines. Nobody's going to pat you on the back except for yourself. Tweet dated October 30th, 2014. My advice, don't sell any Aaron Judge cards you have. Wow. Hashtag AFL 14 Arizona Fall League. If you're wondering what AFL stands for. There you have it, guys. That's why we haven't discussed Mr. Aaron Judge, local boy, about 20 minutes from Stockton, California. He grew up, went to Fresno State three years ago, telling you guys not to sell this kid's cards. I would advise now selling and uh, go buying something that you need and or want. So you'll have to excuse me. I got a little excited when I saw that the Arizona Fall League schedule had been released. When I paired that up with my own personal work schedule, I noticed that it looks like I might be able to sneak off for at least a week, week and a half, perhaps two weeks of fun over in Scottsdale, Tempe, Arizona. I'm certainly something I'm looking forward to very, very much. And uh, I, I remember distinctly watching Aaron Judge. I was at uh, Mesa Park, the Cubs Stadium, Cubs Park in Mesa. I remember this very distinctly. It was the first time I'd ever been there, so I was trying to find the right place to sit. And I want to say it was his first time up. He hit this home run that I think is still going. And I was like, oh, my God. And uh, anybody who's ever been to the Arizona Fall League, I mean, you know, it's you and your your – your five closest friends who are usually attending these games and some autograph hounds. And so you can get really close to these guys. So you, I mean, basically, you know, you walk right next to Aaron judge and just the size of this man. And I was very impressed with his plate discipline and the fact that he wasn't like swinging and missing a lot. A lot. It seemed like he had a real clue again. This was two and a half years ago. So what did I do? Probably during the game, I actually probably whipped out my, at the time, I think I had a Samsung tablet and started buying some of his low-end cards on checking my cards. I ended up with probably 75 of them. And I probably still have about 20 left. And needless to say, those have shot up in value uh, probably about 1,000%. Uh, so quite a bit because his cards had been cheap for uh, quite some time and even earlier this year. Um, so again, just thought I'd throw that out there as I saw that the Arizona Fall League is coming and uh, certainly has been a part of my card buying strategy over the year to go to the Arizona Fall League, get next to these guys, get next to Corey Seager, get next to Billy Hamilton, get next to Chris Bryant, get next to Aaron Judge. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of the top guys of today, Lindor, most of these guys. Anybody who's followed prospects in baseball know that uh, these guys come through. Highlight of last year, obviously, was Tim Tebow playing, which is certainly an interesting uh, sideshow to watch him. But they have a little Bowman hitting challenge that I've been to two or three different times. It's really fun, kind of a home run derby hitting contest. Really fun. Uh, they might even stream it online. But on today's show, I could talk all day about Tempe, Scottsdale, spring training, Arizona Fall League. Probably my favorite place to visit uh, right now, uh, that's not in the summertime. Any time to go late fall. I love Tempe, Scottsdale, uh, that area, and obviously spring training and Arizona Fall League are right at the top of the list. Today's show, we're gonna talk. We're gonna button up some topics on the national, and uh, we'll discuss that. I'll throw out some more thoughts and opinions from the week that was business idea related to the national i'm going to have a slightly different 
check out my card strategy and this would have helped when I was buying Aaron Judge cards. But I'll explain that since after I talked with Tim from Check Out My Cards, the more I thought about it, the more I need to uh, diversify some of my spending on there. Since I've spent a lot on portfolios and cards recently on there, I've kind of refreshed some of my inventory and uh, have had some really good months actually. Um, but I'm going to change up my strategy a little bit going into the end of the year, end of the year and into next year. And I'll explain that a little bit and talk to you guys about that. Lastly, uh, I noticed, you know, my brother and I did a podcast. If you, if you don't know my brother and I, Colin, the host of the sports card show podcast, we did a joint podcast as we, I think is a yearly tradition, four or five, six year yearly tradition. Uh, one of the only times of the year where we'll do a podcast together and we, and we did that. So I encourage you to check that out. One of the topics we briefly touched on was the Dak Prescott situation. And I just want to clarify some statements that I made and reiterate, actually not clarify, but just reiterate some statements that I made because I saw that, uh, some discussion was going on there, which means people are listening. So that's pretty cool, uh, too, as well. Uh, one thing I would have been uh, wrong about, and I'm sure you could dig up some old quotes or tweets about uh, national attendance, which has been going up every year, almost exponentially, since the Cleveland National, which was a little cricketsville several years ago. I went to Chicago, went to Atlantic City, and back to Chicago, and it feels like the attendance every year is getting stronger and stronger, and even Atlantic City, which certainly wasn't my favorite national, uh, attendance was strong there uh, for that area, and um, I felt like, you know, most of the days there, fairly strong attendance, although I wasn't there stunned, I jetted up to Boston for Pearl Jam. I I heard lots of different reasons for why kind of cards have made a little bit of a comeback here. Certainly, if you go by the interest in the National Sports Card Collectors Convention, you know, I heard Aaron Judge and Cody Bellinger tearing it up and various rookies, the Cubs and just that market, the Cubs winning for the first time in 1865 years it certainly rejuvenate rejuvenated people being in the city and staying in the city i felt it i felt you know the same way walking around san francisco people felt like winners and uh, it's great to be in a city uh after a, a you know one of the the main or one of the main sports teams wins a championship uh everybody just uh seems to have a little more pep in their step and they feel like winter winners too so you, you know you, you could credit that and, and that bringing out a whole new wave of collectors or prospective collectors who are interested in the cubs memorabilia or baseball in general uh the vintage market being strong still older cards and whales coming out and guys coming out and and uh taking days off bill simmons flying in probably from la for a day to check out the show on on the vip day just guys like to come check things out spend some money and uh then go home but i i think it'd be foolish to try to pinpoint one reason why hey this show was a freaking success and believe me there was many times where i was standing around and i just kind of was looking around like is this really happening like is it this many people here at this show i mean it was uh astonishing to me and uh you know it just kind of brings all facets of collectors or hobbyists together and uh, all can be celebrated from the guys who go from table to table buy a card and then go try to flip it or trade it or sell it to the de the dealer at the next table i mean how gangster is that i have so much respect for those guys if you if you do that at the national drop me a line sports card news on twitter sports card show at gmail.com tell me what you've done i'd love to bring you on a show actually how you how you do that if you've made over you know a thousand bucks doing that per day i think you could if you really knew your stuff you could either trade up or you could or you could cash out maybe at the end of the day a lot of respect for those guys there are less of those guys than the guys sitting there with their handmade checklist paper checklist searching through quarter bins dollar bins five dollar bins ten dollar bins those could be vintage cards, those could be modern cards. 
you saw a table, you know, those tables that had those type of boxes and that type of inventory, there were usually guys sitting there with paper checklists, or at least maybe one going in their head, digging through, looking at the backs of cards, looking at the condition, looking to see if that was the one they needed, they wanted, the one to complete their set. There are lots of those people still out there. I saw lots of those people at the show with the paper checklist, checking off vintage cards, checking off a modern set, checking off a player checklist, checking off a team checklist. Doesn't matter how you enjoy the hobby. You could be the guy flipping cards on check on my cards, flipping cards at dealer tables, wheeling and dealing. Chasing the hottest guy, chasing the Aaron Judge and the Bellinger cards, trying to run those up. You could be the guy who's looking to pick up some 10 cent commons to fill a set that he's been working on for two and a half years just because he liked the design. He liked the players in it. He got hooked on a few packs, buying a few packs at a shop or a show or at Target or Walmart. It doesn't matter. And that's what's great about uh, the National is that it brings all these people together. And someone like me who's maybe a little more agnostic and who can uh, doesn't really care what side of the aisle I'm on. I could talk to the vintage dealer about the market. I could talk to the modern guy. I could talk to the set collector and builder. I'm looking to bring one actually on the show to talk about that and the, that process. I don't really care. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just interested in it all. I think it's interesting that there's many different facets. So yeah, when somebody tells me, you know, when somebody from a card company tells me, yeah, this is, you know, gosh, Aaron Judge and Cody Bellinger are driving this. Uh, I maybe could believe that. Somebody saying, hey, the Cubs winning and just this market and it's always been kind of a good show here. Shoot. You know, I could believe that too. Strong vintage market. Again, that's been true for about seven or eight years. So all these things kind of converging all these different facets of collector i think that's what has uh, really driven the national attendance that there still are not everybody is chasing the hottest guy the aaron judge card not everybody is a cubs fan not everybody's collecting vintage cards but that's what makes the hobby great because there's so many different options there's so many different facets uh, that you could dive into my advice if you can make it out to cleveland next year uh do it Certainly not my favorite uh, location or venue. It's a little bit like the Chicago show. It's way out there. Like it's not in, quote, Cleveland. It's like almost feels like it's in like a little suburb. And yeah, there's some hotels kind of close by and, and whatnot, but it's a little sterile. I think I'm going to do the same thing next year in Cleveland that I did this year in Chicago and stay in the city. And they have some uh, public transportation. Usually I'm an Uber guy. But the problem with taking where I was staying in Chicago, yeah, it's only a 20 minute drive. But if I took an Uber, it might take an hour and a half. Thankfully, they have some good public transportation in Chicago. And here's why you want to take the public transportation. This is why you can stay in the city and still get to the national in 20, 25 minutes, no matter where you're staying in the city, because you're going out toward O'Hare. Everybody in the morning. So when you're going out to the show in the morning, you're going out toward O'Hare everybody's coming to the city and working you're leaving the city so there's nobody on your L train it's not a hot sweaty packed L train at 90 degrees and 90 percent humidity you're sitting there chilling in your own seat and then when the show's over and you're coming back into the city you're coming back into the city while everybody's leaving the city so it's perfect and I could see the same thing happening in Cleveland, they have some kind of little train, or maybe like half train, half Uber kind of situation. Maybe you get to a spot and then you take Uber out to the IX Center. Highly advise doing that. Cleveland downtown, you know, guys, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You got a casino down there. You might run into some of the players down there um, doing some things. So that's my plan next year. It's a much larger venue compared to Chicago, so it's hard to compare attendance. This is my third time in Chicago, and I'm like, yeah, this is the most packed I've ever seen it in freaking Chicago. A little harder in Cleveland because it's way more spread out. So it's not going to have that kind of packed feeling, even if there are as many or more people there next year. But I'm really curious to go out there and curious to see if if things can kind of progress. Um, 
And, you know, there's so many different facets of the hobby. I, I, I don't see why there won't at least be a strong showing next year out in Cleveland. One of my business opportunities that I hope uh, some somebody ambitious in the hobby will take a stab at is, yeah, I talked to several of the board members at, over at the National, and it's pretty clear they're not coming out west. You know, next year is going to be Cleveland, then they're obviously going to go back to Chicago in 2020. They're going to Atlantic City. I mean, 2021, if they're not coming back to Chicago, you know, be shocked. So, you know, we're talking about four or five years before even the potential for this show to hit Vegas, to hit Tempe, to hit San Francisco, to hit Los Angeles. Years, years before this could happen. So, you know, we I've seen the, this attendance of this show grow. I, ha, I even have a website, findacardshow.com, because I love card shows. Big or small, doesn't have to be a freaking national with 500 tables. I'd go, if there was a show close enough, I would go. I've been, I drove up to Sacramento one time and it was a 12 de- table show. I had a blast. I bought a bunch of things. I still have it. Some old 49er stuff that I just kind of have displayed at, at, at my place. Picked up a few things, picked up, I think an old junk whack box. A fun time. It was, it was certainly worth the drive. And you know, again, there was 20 tables at most. I love card shows. I hope somebody starts a West Coast show. And maybe people have tried. I think it's not going to be a single single person. It's going to have to be a, a team or a group of people putting together and using their collective uh, funds and also connections, hopefully within the hobby, to kickstart something and do it. Do one in Vegas. Do one in Scottsdale during spring training. Do one during the fall league. You'll have every single guy, you'll have, you know, 70% of the people that go to the fall league, they go get the autographs in the first inning, and then they might bolt and try to come back at the end of the game and get autographs. They're not going to watch the game. They'd certainly go to a card show, pick up some singles of those guys. When spring training's going on, certainly a good time to hold a card show then during some of the peak weekends in March. San Francisco would be difficult. Admittedly, I live an hour from there, flew into Oakland. One, it's very expensive. Two, any dealer traveling a great distance uh, could have to come over some mountains, uh, could have to navigate the nightmare that is uh, driving around San Francisco. Even though the traffic, and I sat in some, in the back of some cars in Chicago, and then while I was zipping out to Rosemont, I saw the traffic lanes uh, going out to O'Hare. San Francisco would be a nightmare. Certainly, Los Angeles is a possibility because you have so many, it's so spread out. It's huge. You could do it in Anaheim, which is not even, it's like, it's like 30, 40 minutes from LA. You could do it in San Diego, which is two hours from LA. Much more options the further south you go. Somebody hold a show. Somebody do a show. I'll come out and promote it. I think a couple of key points that I put here. uh, uh, Well, three probably. One, it couldn't be a single person. I knew a guy who who did a Sacramento show. I think he had some success with it. But it was just just too hard. And he also wasn't a guy coming from the hobby. He did comic cons and stuff. Very successful Comic Cons. I mean, the line to the Stockton California Comic Con was as long or longer than the national line this year to show you how crazy and popular that is. He did a Sacramento Card Joy. I have a video of that up, up on YouTube. You could get a kind of a layout of it. But he was one single guy trying to do it. It's going to have to be a team of people. That's point one. Point two, take care of your dealers. Those guys are the golden ticket. I mean, I heard of and know of some dealers. They fly out the whales and the big customers to the national. If you're coming in and you're dropping 10 one day, and 10,000 and you're dropping $100,000 on some vintage cards or some vintage wax, and there are guys who do that. 
some investor groups. And I, you know, I heard all kinds of different things. Those guys get flown out, get put up the same way a whale coming into Vegas at the craps table. He's not going to have to pay for a room. He's not going to have to pay for his weed or his cocaine. He's not going to have to pay to have that girl come up and provide some service. That's not going to be paid for. Same thing happens in the national. Guys get uh, flown out. Guys get dinners. Guys get comp strip club. Guys get better deals. The only way this happens is if you take care of those dealers. So as you as a show promoter, I know you want to get out there and you want to reach as many collectors as you can. Well, the way you reach as many collectors as you can is you take care of your dealers. And you reach as many of those as you can. And you try to bend over backwards to let them know it's going to be a great show. Because they'll promote it for you. Embrace the social media aspect Point three, I think that's something that has helped the national people being able to see inside, seeing how many tables there are, seeing who's signing autograph, seeing that JLo's there, seeing that things are going on, seeing that podcasts are getting recorded from there live and that stuff's going right onto the internet, seeing that you can get your cards graded there, you can get deals on boxes, on singles, you can meet fellow collectors, you can trade, you can do whatever you want. And I think social media and just kind of the snowball effect of that has really helped. People want to go and show off what they got, show off the show, show off that I'm here. So certainly embrace that if you're looking to promote a show because you're going to have to get off the ground. And the only way you're going to do that, I think, is if it's one, a team of people that you're working with. I think the National has something like 12 or 15 board members. I mean, it's uh, it's it's a whole bunch of people working on this the national even outsourced the autograph pavilion to tristar they run all that they get the deals with the athletes they organize the sales of the tickets and the autographs something to consider as well it's almost two different hats running the show setting up the dealers getting the logistics of that set up and then dealing with these athletes and these agents and them coming in that sounds like a nightmare i'd rather outsource that tristar would probably be my first call though there's probably uh, if, you, if you're just starting out, maybe you only need a couple guys for your very first show. Lots of things you could do. I, tr- I would try different ways to differentiate yourself. Think of some new ideas. Bring technology into the fold. I mean, at the Long Beach Expo Coin Center, you can go type in a coin and it'll tell you what, what table dealers have it at. Talked about how dealers, you know, maybe having QR codes on their cards so collectors can look them up on eBay. Kicker is it's an affiliate link, so if they go buy anything on eBay, you're getting a percentage of that. Even if they're not buying anything from you, they just looked up the card at your table, which is happening anyways. That's happening all the time now, and I noticed that quite a bit, and I was like, well, you know, that's kind of an awkward situation. You know, here's a guy has a price on a card, or they're negotiating. This guy's kind of looking up last completed on eBay as kind of his price guide, Uh, you know. I would turn an awkward situation into a money-making situation and uh, promote the, you know, get an affiliate link on that guy's phone. Say, here, don't type in the search. Here, I can take you right to it with this link. Boop. I would find a way to do that. I think there's di- that would be different ways to monetize the show instead of just selling dealer spots, selling out the autograph guest, selling, you know, T-shirts and hamburgers and hot dogs and whatnot. Maybe some different ways to monetize this. You've got a lot of people coming in. Maybe have some money. Maybe spend a lot of money on the hobby throughout the year. So my my top locations would probably be Tempe, Scottsdale during spring training or the fall league. It would be much cheaper probably to set something up in the fall league. A little more expensive for some kind of space or larger space in spring training as people jack up rates and hotels are more expensive. And, you know, obviously more touristy and more people coming into town at that point. So you'd have to be ready to go full guns blazing if you do it during spring training. Fall you can find a cheap space and you would have a small built-in customer base. So I guarantee you could ha- get half those kids who have cards anyways and who need cards and are looking for stuff so that they can go get Eloy Jimenez or whoever the next top prospect is to sign him 20 autographs before the start of the game. Anybody who th- who's there. 
they they need some of those cards so that they can go get signed. Tempe Scottsdale during those times anywhere in Southern California, Los Angeles, Anaheim, San Diego, anywhere, anywhere in that vicinity uh, would be fine. San Francisco, I would love it'd be the closest to me potentially. But that would be a freaking logistics nightmare. Sacramento's doable, but um, probably lower down on the list. Sacramento would, I'm about 50 minutes from Sacramento, and it's a straight shot up Highway 5. So that would be the closest, easiest I could stay at home. But not quite as conducive to a larger crowd or really getting something going. Probably my last choice would be. Sacramento for a West Coast show. You could go further up the coast. You could go Portland. You could go Seattle. You could settle for a little more Midwestern Dallas. San Antonio, Houston. Although that's a long flight for me, so that doesn't really count. Seattle's still less than a two-hour flight. I think that's an hour and 45 minutes. I'd love to go back up there during the summertime or uh, late spring early fall seems like the times to be there time i was there for a pearl jam concert it was balls cold but uh quite a cool area west coast weeds legal be great and we obviously can't leave uh, vegas out of the mix probably been to vegas i'm embarrassed probably to say but potentially And of course, it would be foolish of me to leave out Vegas. I'm probably a little embarrassed to say how many times I've been there. Probably maybe 20 or 25 times in the last few years. I mean, I was just there for a day and a half before the National. And then I flew in on a Sunday after the National to Vegas. Got there, was taking a look at the flights for Monday morning. And they were like so expensive. And it was so cheap to, to fly out on Tuesday. So I convinced myself that it was actually cheaper to just stay an extra day in Vegas and go to the Vidara pool and then go to the Aria pool and compare the difference and, uh, you know, make sure that I hit, you know, Shake Shack, Javier's, and then Mastro's. I did Mastro's uh, Steakhouse one night uh, for dinner. So hit all my favorite spots, stayed in my favorite uh, hotel rooms. The, the Vidar even upgraded me for free to the executive corner suite. So I appreciate uh, the hospitality there maybe shows the, the, you know what a sucker I am. They could probably look up on their computer like, God, this guy was just here a few days ago and he, now he's back. So Vegas, my advice with Vegas, it might be hard to do something right on the strip. Um, you, maybe, maybe you could do it downtown somewhere, uh, which is you know not that far from the quote unquote strip. You know, you, you could go do it down. Uh, you know, the Binions and stuff and, and down in that area. You could do it just off strip. I would definitely pair it with a Raiders game, uh, some kind of sports themed event in Vegas. So I, I think that that would be the opportunity in Vegas, especially with the Raiders coming in and then building that stadium there. Stadium's going to be a little bit off the strip. I mean, it's not going to be freaking right next to the Aria or anything or the Bellagio. It's going to be kind of, I think they're pushing a little further south, but it's not that far. You're going to be able to probably see it from your rooms. And, um, I mean, a, a show right near there during that time. The Raiders game is going to be quite the destination, not only for Raiders fans, but also the away fans. Those, they're going to sell those packages. I mean, I could just see it now, all the season tickets that I have to NFL teams. He's going to be sending me that package. Oh, fly to Vegas, and we'll put you up, and you're going to get a game ticket. And you're... There's going to be a lot of ways for them to sell those tickets. And, you know, a Packers coming in. Uh, you know, whoever the hot team of the day is, Patriots, Steelers, Cowboys, Cowboys, Raiders in Vegas. Yeah, that's going to be a hot ticket. I don't care, you know, how the Raiders are quote unquote doing. So certainly options in Vegas, lots of spaces, lots of lots of things you could go with Vegas. Getting the dealers there, eh, maybe maybe a harder challenge. It's harder to tell the wife, oh, I'm going to go set up at a card show in, quote, Vegas. Hmm. Explain that one. A little easier to tell them San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, Sacramento, Scottsdale, Tempe. There's, although Tempe, Scottsdale, trust me, 
the talent there is uh, as high as anywhere in the uh, country. So there you go. My thoughts on a West Coast show. Fingers crossed. Tempe, Scottsdale, Vegas, L.A., San Francisco, Sacramento, Portland, Seattle. In no particular order. Just please make it happen. Again, you can reach out to me. Sports Card News on Twitter. I'll blast the hell out of your show. I'll do videos. I'll do a podcast. You're going to have to cut me something. Cut me a hotel room. Cut me something. Let me know that JLo's coming so I can go over there and get a picture. Throw me a Eddie Vedder autograph. I'll be there. I'll help you promote it. Uh, certainly if it's an area that I'm going to go to anyways. But give it some thought. It's going to take a team of people. Probably more than two. Probably more than three. Again, the National has like something like 12 or 15 board members. Lots of people working on this. Lots of people with input. Lots of people with connections. Lots of people with different skill sets. And that is what it's going to take. And hopefully uh, maybe somebody will pull it off. And maybe if they see the growth of these national shows and attendance or at least recent growth maybe it's something somebody will give a shot moving on to my uh check on my card strategy which will change after i talked with the uh, president owner ceo tim getch at the national uh he's he, at some point i think as early as january 1st 2018 it's going to be about the same price to sell something on check on my cards as it would be on ebay i mean he he knows that he has to do this, that he's hurting. He's he's missing out on opportunities to sell those cards that people would send him the mid to higher tier cards and even like high, high tier cards, thousand dollar cards, ten thousand dollar cards on up because that that if it sells on eBay or Amazon, this the seller is getting hit with 20 percent. And when he cashes out, he gets hit with 20 percent more, which is higher than it would be to just scan and list that card on ebay so if you have some you know mid to high-end cards and you're not an ebay grinder and maybe you're just selling a card here or there yeah it probably would actually be worth it to just even the time it takes and the risk of of getting uh you know charged back on on ebay or, or dealing with customers or dealing with something that happens on ebay it's still probably worth it to do that because you're just you're just going to make more money in the long run Tim from Check Out My Cards knows that he needs to change this. And this is going to happen. And he's probably going to do it. The reason why I say January 1st is because it just works accounting-wise. And I, it makes perfect sense to me, you know, that why that would would be. Because he has one set of accounting and fees, and this is how, you know, the money coming in. And then once he totally drastically changes it, uh, it could just get a little messy at the end of the year when you're doing your taxes. And somebody who's got, you know, three warehouses and close to 100 employees... Uh, you know, whoever is doing his taxes is, you know, earning their money there for sure. get <laughs> Guaranteed. So just to make it cleaner, a little easier, he's going to change these fees. And my guess it's going to happen in uh, January just because the eBay thing is, is become such a popular feature. And it's it could be the key to the site. So my strategy really these last gosh, I don't even know when became members of the site. I think about seven years ago, maybe 2010 or something. Flipping low in cards. Again, the best deal I probably ever got was I bought 10,000 hockey cards for nine cents each. And it, 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 when the transaction went through, it slowed down the site for like 15 minutes. The entire site was slowed down processing this and transferring these cards into my account. And I instantly became like the top, had the like the top 10 most cards on the entire site. And so my sales exploded. These were hockey cards. Nobody was submitting these cards. I got them for such a cheap price. I think even at that time, it was 15 or 20 cents to submit your card. So I was even getting it below the submission price. And it was just an absolute home run. It was a straight, probably double or triple up within a year, year and a half. And uh, with, with one particular account, I've continued this strategy for many years. Probably haven't deposited or submitted any cards in years so that's a very key statement. Haven't deposited money or sent in cards in years. Years. I've just continuously turned over inventory after inventory. 
I have 35,000 cards listed for sale. So think about that, those big 3,500 count boxes. I have 10 of those stacked to the freaking ceiling for sale right now on Check Out My Cards, eBay, and Amazon. I've done quite a bit of sales, but they're mostly low in cards. It's low risk. I pay about 4 to $5 in fees every month. That's it. Yes, you heard that right. In terms of fixed fees to sell, uh, if, if I don't cash out and get the 20% cash out, which I normally don't do, I just reinvest. I only pay like 4 or $5 a month in fees. The rest is just, boom, money into the account. Buy more cards, resell them, buy more cards, resell them. Done this over and over. There's a video on YouTube where I literally break it all down. I just show you exactly how much money I put in and how much money I made. Now, it was a couple years ago, and I was on a 100% free roll. Everything had been bought and paid for. Everything, All 35,000 cards in my account are literally bought and paid for, and I'm on a, 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 a lifelong free roll on check out my cards, as I call it, because I don't submit cards. I don't take huge risk. I buy low-end low cards that even if the guy sucks or takes steroids or beats his wife, I'm probably never going to drop that low in value. People still need it for a set. People still may want it. People may want to flip it. Maybe I got that good a deal. Other flippers buy cards for me. That happens quite often. Probably some of my number one customers are just guys who do the same thing I am. Kind of a middleman. Bought and sold over 100,000 cards. Mostly low in cards. But after talking with Tim, and his plan is to you know basically make it so that you can set whatever you, you would make on eBay on that $100 card, you're going to make with him. You're going to get all that money in your account. It's going to be dang close. It's going to be pretty close. That's That would be my guess. I don't know for sure. We didn't we didn't talk numbers. He didn't show me, you know, he didn't let me in behind the curtain and show me his plans. And he has a multitude of them. I don't even think he really knows. But he knows the number has to be close. It has to be close enough so that he starts getting that business. And I think that's smart. I think it's smart for buyers because you not only get exposed on his site, you get exposed on eBay and you get exposed on Amazon. You're going to get more eyeballs for sure than if you just list it on eBay. And he's going to do all the work for you. He's going to pack and ship for you. Any questions, any returns, any chargebacks, any issues, that all goes back to him. Card sells on Amazon, card sells on Check My Cards, card sells on eBay through his account. He deals with everything. You just sit back and get money and sell cards and maybe buy more cards as I've done and keep selling them. Strategy is going to change though because he's going to make, he's going to make it so that those are tight numbers. So I need more mid to higher in cards. So I think I'm going to commit. You know, I have about five hundred to a thousand dollars in sales every month, and I usually just turn those over. I bought a seven hundred dollar port recently. Such a good deal. I had trout graded cards and bunch of Chris Bryant's and just an unbelievable deal could have paid twice as much and still been a double up so it's just a great value for 700 there and I recently bought another one I don't know it was only like it was a smaller one 250 bucks maybe 500 uh, to a thousand cards I can't remember how many but it was another good deal mostly baseball good stuff there easy double triple up but I'm gonna take if I'm bringing in 500 to a thousand dollars a month free cash it's all free cash because i'm only paying like four dollars a month in fees in storage fees so it's just free cash flow sitting in the account i'm gonna spend minimum a hundred dollars a month mid to higher end cards five ten on up to hundred dollar plus willing to spend that much i have some cards in my mind i love a, a jeter sp 1993 card that's going to probably cost a graded one's going to cost more than a hundred bucks willing to buy that I want a high grade PSA 9 or 10 Griffey 89 upper deck. I'm going to prospect Brandon Ingram Laker cards because I think they're still underpriced. And I think one of the comps you could use from recent years is Devin Booker's. You could look to see what Devin Booker, a very, very good player, could be a potential MVP actually of the league. He's kind of stuck out in purgatory over in Phoenix. I love going there, but it's not exactly... NBA destination number one. I think he had like a 70-point game or something this year, something insane. The guy's an absolute score. He's an athletic, healthy Dwayne Wade, maybe with more athleticism and maybe even a better jumper. The guy's unbelievable, and he's young. And you could go look at to see what his cards are worth. And I think 
Ingram, while he maybe is not as exciting and not as flashy, he plays for the freaking Lakers. And I saw him the one game in summer league that he played. I think he had 26 points and 10 odd rebounds and defended. He he's often compared to Kevin Durant. I don't I don't know if he'll ever be as good as Kevin Durant. That would be freaking amazing if he was. But I think he could be close, but a better defender. Kid can test shots. He's a legit seven footer. He can get his shot up whenever he wants. They were working him in the post. He's he's filled out a little more, although he's you know he's still rail thin. He's a big guy, and he can move, and he can dribble, and he's athletic, and he he would be a nightmare to defend. There's nobody. There's not too many guys in the league that could defend him, and there's nobody that's going to block his shot. He could get a shot whenever he wants. So I'm prospecting him and just comping between Devin Booker, a recent really, really good player whose cards are, are fairly expensive for, again, a guy who's stuck out in the 120-degree heat in Arizona right now. Compared to a guy who's going to play on the Lakers, who's going to have Lonzo Ball on his team, who's going to be a wa- walking rock rock star, uh, rock concert everywhere the Lakers go this year, potentially, if the father shows up, if Ball is Jason Kidd reincarnated, if Ingram takes a step forward, if they win out the gate, you're going to see M- Magic Johnson's smiling face everywhere. The Lakers don't have their first round pick this year. They're going to try to win, and that's going to make a huge difference. And B- Brandon Ingram might be their best player. He's that good. I saw him. I was six rows up. I was sitting behind Magic Johnson and Floyd Mayweather. And when I didn't have my eyes on all the women that Floyd had with him and being so close to one of my idols, Magic Johnson, I've never been that close to him. So to see him was pretty freaking amazing. And then to be five rows behind him, like literally five rows behind him, I was behind him. Floyd was a little further down the aisle. He was about maybe seven, eight seats from Magic on the row. And all his girls were sitting. uh, I think his girls took up the first two rows. Floyd's girls, not Magic's Floyd's. Could have been Magic's too, maybe back in the day. Magic uh, had that reputation too. Long-winded way to come around to say that Brandon Ingram cards are still a little cheap compared to Devin Booker, and I think they have the potential to exceed uh, the value of those. I was watching him around the show on, I think it was Sunday, or whenever I did some buying at the show, Saturday maybe, when it was so crowded, I was like, let me dive in here with a few hundred bucks and buy some cards. I was looking for Brandon Ingram cards. And maybe that one game looks like I looked over the year price data on Terapeak. A Brandon Ingram card researched a bunch of his different cards. Yeah, some decent ones from Panini. Best time to buy would have been looked like January, February, March. He started playing better at the end of the year. And then obviously recently the, the prices ticked up some. And certainly at the national when I was spotting prices from people, I was just kind of getting prices. And of course I was doing the same thing. I was looking up on eBay what these cards were selling for. Somebody could have got affiliated to link me because I was looking them up on eBay, asking dealers what the price was and then checking it. It was a little high at the show. eBay is still the best place to get a great deal. And I mean, by far. Good deals on the 93 Jeter SP. I can't find, I mean, on checking my cards, those are so high. Whereas you can get one a little more reasonably priced on eBay, and that's maybe what I'll have to do. I'd love a 1990 no, Frank, uh, no name on front, Frank Thomas. It's another card I want to buy. So I'm a prospect, Brandon Ingram, because he's low compared to Devin Booker. I'm going to buy some key cards, really, of my era. 93 Jeter SP. 90 Upper Deck Ken Griffey. No name on front. 90, 1990 Tops. Frank Thomas. Not really to sell or not re- maybe sell eventually. But these could be long longer term holds for me. Because if cards continue to be popular, if National keeps getting more attendance, sure, maybe less people know who Mickey Mantle is. But they'll know who Derek Jeter is. They'll know who LeBron James is. They'll know who Kobe Bryant is. Everybody's going to worship Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan couldn't sign enough autographs for what the demand is going to be for him. So 
I've built up uh, so many cards on Check Out My Cards, and I have a you know fair to average amount of sales per month, five hundred thousand bucks. It's enough to pick up some things or save up for a couple months. Maybe my hundred dollars a month is a little low. I bought a forty dollar graded Kareem, like I think it was like seventy one tops or something like that. Seemed like a good deal. You know, just kind of going on eBay, comping prices and making offers. Either these guys accept, counter, or, or, or decline. Doesn't really matter to me. Money's sitting in my account anyways. I'm going to dump it off into, into other cards. Why not take a, a greater shot? And it looks like the fees are going to change. And what a genius someone like my brother and myself are going to look like if he drastically changes the fees and it's, quote unquote, cheaper to cash out. Guess who will be smart I've not only not deposited money, I've not only not submitted any cards in several years, I haven't withdrawn any money in quite some time. I haven't withdrawn cash in quite some time. I took some blowout uh, gift certificates, I think, earlier in the year, maybe about $1,000 worth, maybe slightly less. But I ended up buying some cards that I sent to Amazon that those are probably all gone too. And I made money on those. So it was just kind of a quick cash out. And then I might have recouped, I probably definitely recouped the 20%. I got dinged on checking my cards. But just getting a blowout gift certificate, buying those, sending that crap to Amazon, and selling that. Boom, all that money's back into my account. I'm not going to have to do that, it sounds like, with checking my cards. It's going to be much cheaper to sell. And look like a freaking genius that I reinvested all this money in all these cards. And I have 10, 3,500 count boxes stacked high, all for sale on Check Out My Cards, eBay, and Amazon. And now it's going to get cheaper to cash out. So every card I sell, I technically, quote unquote, make more money. Are you kidding? So I might as well take a greater shot. It sounds like some more of these cards are going to come onto the site. It makes sense. People are going to be like, wow, it's cheaper to sell on there now. And I don't have to do anything. It's going to be listed on Check Out My Cards, eBay, and Amazon. And I don't have to deal with anything. And it's about the same or or the same price to sell. Maybe it takes a little longer. That'll probably certainly always be the rub. It's not gonna be instantaneous. It's not gonna be able to, you know, one day auction your your hot super fractor you just pulled. And maybe uh, certainly eBay is always gonna be relevant, or at least for the next several years, many years potentially, eBay is gonna be relevant in the hobby because it's it's an easy way to turn over money and get quick cash. Check out my cards is going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And, you know, that's his baby. That's his project over there. And if he's going to lower fees, great. I just made a whole bunch more money. I might as well reinvest. Uh, look at, you know, look at all the vintage options on there. I'm going to just really cast a wide net. Try to get key players, key cards. Um, don't don't dive too far off the wagon. You know, LeBron, Kobe, Jordan. You know, when we're talking about basketball, obviously I'm going to prospect Ingram. But with baseball, you know, those Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame guys. Hall of Fame guys. Top tier. And certainly Jeter and Griffey, I think, qualify that. The, the Frank Thomas card, certainly he was a great player. Um, not quite on the level of, of Griffey or, or Jeter, but um, at least popularity-wise. But that card is such a key card, and it's something I've always wanted, and those have gone up quite a bit. And it's an iconic card. And again, if, if cards continue to be relevant in onto the future, which I think it's a strong possibility they will be, that's always going to be one people are going to want. And it's not that easy to find. Much easier to find an 89 Upper Deck and a 93 Jeter SP, obviously. But I'd love to dip back in and, and, and get a run of 60s Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, Ted Williams, Jackie Robinson. On and on and on. So instead of buying these little penny nickel dime quarter cards, buying portfolios for seven hundred dollars and and flipping them over, might as well step out. I've been to enough of these shows. I'm seeing these people dropping all this money on these cards. Might as well pick up some that I like, that I kind of cherish a little bit. If I if I keep them, great. If they go up quite a bit in value, I'll definitely sell them. But I think I think there's a lower risk there. Even if the economy crashes, great. Maybe I'll, I'll pick up a few more. Maybe they'll be cheaper. And when the upswing happens again, when everybody falls in love with, with Jordan and Kobe and Jeter 
and insert your favorite player here. Stuff will always have value. These guys made so much money in their career. I don't think they're going to be out signing every last little thing. Certain guys will. Certain guys blow their money. Certain guys need it. Certain guys don't. Michael Jordan and Derek Jeter. These guys aren't going to be signing until on their deathbed. There may come a point in time when they stop signing. So I think getting a good autograph or some kind of key rookie card in the case of Jeter. So again, I'd love a Jeter autograph as well. On card, something nice, something where the ink is going to hold up. Decent condition, certainly doesn't have to be a 10 or a 9.5. Just the, the card looks nice, autographs real, autographs on there. No sticker, and you couldn't pay me to buy a sticker. Love a Joe Montana rookie card. Those have gone up quite a bit in value. Jerry Rice rookie card, Walter Payton. On and on and down the line. Barry Sanders, some of that 89 stuff, you could get high grade. I think it's going to hold up well. Those cards, you know, oftentimes didn't come out 8-9 out of the pack. Off-center, chipped, bad printing. I mean, they just printed and printed and printed. Some high grade, 9-5-10. Barry Sanders, rookie card. Sign me up for that. Troy Aikman. You could go on and on down the line. So I think that'll be kind of fun, researching some certain cards. You know, it's only going to be maybe 20, 25 certain players, certain cards maybe. Researching those prices, I can go back over a year on eBay and look at prices. Auction houses, you know, have their whole entire history on there. If it's like a bigger card, more expensive card, vintage card, I could literally look up the price data for years and years and years on a particular graded vintage card uh, if, if need be. A popular, you know, modern car like the Jeter. You could check that price history fairly easily. So that's going to be my strategy. Dive into that a little bit, or at least d spend some money on that. And it may become a larger portion. Obviously, buy a bigger card for a few hundred dollars, or maybe even over a thousand dollars. It's going to eat up some of your budget for a month or two, and that's fine. I don't care. Again, I haven't withdrawn, haven't deposited, haven't sent any cards in in many years. I've just turned the cards over and over and over. Recently spent about over $1,000 kind of refreshing with Trouts and Chris Bryant's and kind of modern stuff. You know, some 2017 stuff was sprinkled in there, 2016 stuff, which I didn't have a lot of any of that stuff my port was kind of old so it was good to kind of refresh it but uh i think with the fees changing and just to kind of spice it up for me i'm gonna definitely uh dive into that also going back to the arizona fall like boy if you listed off the top 20 prospect you know a few years ago i would be like oh yep seen him seen him oh yep judge is going to be a stud seeker is going to be a stud blah 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 i could have rattled you off you know the entire guy's game when i saw him what is you know what he did in that game what impressed me what did he sign autographs i could literally give you like a full scouting report on so many guys so many guys and they played for the A's or came through the Cal League. I could, I, I saw Trevor Story take 100 at bats. I could have told you he was going to suck or his cards were going to go down. Saw all these guys. Saw all the key Giants prospects, Bone Garner, Posey, Crawford, Panic. I saw Panic take 150 at bats probably. I saw him maybe as, as, as most out of anybody. The second baseman for the Giants, a good player. All starts I think he made last year. Seen a bunch of guys. Bryant. Seen Bryant play in college. Problem is, that was a few years ago, and all these guys have either become studs or, or washed out or won MVPs. Now, I couldn't tell you who the new guys coming up are. And I made quite a bit of money on Corey Seager cards and Correa cards. And insert whoever blew up. Judge, Frazier, anybody. I, I, I bought and sold, you know, 100,000 cards on eBay. I go to the Fall League. What do you think I'm doing? I'm buying cards of guys who I think are going to be studs and get called up and be good. Corey Seager was one of my better ones. He blew up. His cards went up quite a bit. They've come down, but I sold out. Judge, I had 75 cards. He was one of the lesser guys I had. I mean, I probably had 1,000 Corey Seager cards when he blew up. I sold all of them. Dang near all of them. Carlos Correa, same thing too. He blew up. His cards have come down. But you, you kind of know when to sell. 
So I need to go back to another strategy. I need to go back to the Fall League this year. Hopefully go for a week and a half, two weeks. Hopefully some of the bigger names or some of the best guys are there. And I can dive in, see a dozen games. The best thing about the Fall League is, you know, each team has like four or five. You know, it's a mixed match of four or five different teams. Yankees, Giants, Angels, Pirates, all on the same team. So in a game, you might see the top four or five prospects, you know, in an organization for each team. The whole lineup stack. The pitcher is, you know, going to throw three innings and is a top guy, Tyler Glass now or somebody like that. Great place to get up close and personal, see these guys, see what they look like, see what their body type's like, and then buy some cards over the next year or two or month or day. Sometimes you see card prices spike during that time. If you don't really realize what that happens, you know, why did that guy's card price spike in, you know, October, November? Well, it's probably the folly. And that happens quite a bit. So sometimes you have to wait a little bit. Wait into January, February, right before spring training. Get him then. Or get him if he doesn't make the team or struggles out of spring training and you still believe him, believe believe in him, keep buying. So I'm going to do that. Go back to the fall league and uh, refresh. It's pretty easy. to. Me. It's become easier for me to, to see a guy and, and recognize talent. Again, we started off the show with a, tweet a two and a half year old tweet about how you shouldn't sell your Aaron Judge cards wow and it wasn't just because the first time I saw him he hit this massive home run that's still going I mean that's kind of impressive but you see that all the time in the fall league the first time I saw Chris Bryant he hit a home run too in the fall league you see guy and, and there have been scrubs that I've seen too that hit you know two home runs in a game or three home runs in a game you see that all the time guys aren't trying to you know work the count or pitch backwards they're throwing fastballs and maybe working two pitches you kind of know what's coming. It's hot up there, but ballparks, you know, juiced a little bit. You're going to see a lot of home runs. It was really his plate discipline. It, that's what I was impressed with was all the other at-bats that he didn't just flail and miss and try to hit another home run. He was kind of working the count. I think he had, maybe had another hit the opposite way. I can't really remember. And just obviously the size of him, too. He looked like a freaking tight end or, a you know, a power forward. I mean, he's a massive guy. So that's part of what's fun, you know, going to the Fall League because you can, you can apply it. You can buy cards and straight come up on some Judge cards and some Corey Seager cards. Who knows? Maybe I've made uh, all the money back selling cards that, that I, you know, maybe it's paid for my flights or my hotels or whatever in the long run if you really look at it. So it's pretty cool. One last thing I want to touch on, Dak Prescott. Uh, I mentioned on the podcast I did with my brother at the national that I heard from several different people, several that this was a passed down auto pen from Aikman to Romo to Dak Prescott. And I just wanted to reiterate that that is what I heard from several people. I wouldn't, I would try to never, especially something kind of as interesting and, um, as the, and as serious as the Dak Prescott situation has become and, and was and is. I would never just willy-nilly, somebody told me this, and start blabbing about it on the podcast. It was one of the lead questions that I asked my brother because there were several different people not connected to each other, don't know each other, wouldn't have talked to each other, wouldn't have got it from the same person. So this is kind of a known story out in the hobby, in hobby circles, from separate people, from different people, from people who wouldn't really be communicating with each other. But again, I kind of go to these shows and I'm kind of agnostic. I could talk to the 70-year-old vintage dealer for a half an hour about the vintage market and what's going on there. And I could talk to the, the new guy who's flipping cards over and over and is going to the strip club later that night and is doing breaks and is, you know, all this stuff. I could talk to those guys just as easily and it'd be just as an entertaining conversation. Basically, anywhere I go in that show could be an interesting conversation, could be an interesting segment into the many facets of the hobby. So I'm talking to various people. I'm talking to, you know, the new guys, the old guys, and everybody in between. And one of the things I, you know, was mentioning to people or they would mention to me is Dak Prescott. So I just want to reiterate that is what I heard. It was from several different people. And uh, certainly something that I stand by. My theory 
is that this the auto pen was meant for kind of fan mail or kind of stock sign stuff you know these guys hold camps and and do charity stuff maybe there's some letterhead that has a you know auto pen dac signature something that you're expecting is is auto pen troy aikman auto pen tony roma maybe there's examples of these floating around if this is indeed a pass down auto pen you should be able to go out maybe at some point when i have a little time maybe maybe after the football season uh or at least the key weeks of the nfl season maybe when i'm at arizona at the fall league i'll look into well where are these auto pen tony romo they're probably not going to be on licensed cards and i think romo and aikman at least might have had some people around them that didn't make this mistake and my theory is that whoever was handling dax cards didn't realize that it would be a huge no-no to auto pen these cards from panini that he was getting paid for it wouldn't be a no-no to auto pen some letterhead or some camp giveaways something that you know people didn't think was a quote authentic autograph you could see several examples of this and the quotes from prescott and some of the confusing quotes from panini don't really make a lot of sense you know especially the panini's a joke they have a bunch of morons over there prescott it makes little sense he this guy could literally recite the entire dallas cowboys playbook on the top of his head he could give you all the running plays and the play actions and the options off those and the hot routes and this and that and this call and he's uh you know sliding his protection this way and they blitz off this way he's going to send this guy this way in motion are you kidding me and you're telling me he lost some cards these cart with these quarterbacks you know like them or love them it's not an easy job you're directing uh, you know 10 other guys it's not just turn around and hand the ball off three steps throw to that guy sometimes maybe it is that easy but the defense isn't <laughs> trying to make your life easy they're not going to run the same thing every time what they look like pre-snap isn't exactly what the defense is going to be once the ball's snapped. And Prescott had a good enough year last year, and certainly my brother believes in him, and he had a good college career, that this guy isn't, this guy isn't a dumb guy by any stretch of the imagination. This guy could become a very good quarterback in the league for one of the most iconic franchises in all of sports. And if he wins a Super Bowl... He, he will become that. He'll be a legend of all time in Dallas. And you could walk up to him on the street right now and be like, give me your, you know, third down running play on a, you know, third and 12 situation on the 35 yard line. And he probably could spit out like four different plays for you. It's not a dumb guy. He didn't lose the cards. This was some jerk off that was in charge, maybe the agent or somebody could have been on down the line and an employee of the agent a friend of Dak that maybe didn't realize what a no-no this would be and what headaches this would cause uh, and maybe there is a I, I I from the people I talk to I firmly believe there's a pass down auto pen from Troy to uh to Tony to Dak it'd be interesting to find those examples I, again, I don't think you're going to find those on licensed cards. It's going to be on something else. From Romo and Aikman, certainly should be floating out there, those pictures, those examples. And uh, it would be interesting to see that if this is indeed the case. And certainly it would be weird to use an auto pen. I mean, Dak could have, somebody could have just signed for Dak. Weird to actually put the cards in an auto pen and program the signature and line it up and choose the right size. Seems like a kind of a complicated process. Certainly not something Dak Prescott's going to be doing. His face is probably buried in a playbook. Or if he's single, it might be buried into something else going on in Dallas or wherever he's at. He could pretty much be anywhere he wants and live wherever he wants and have whatever he wants. I don't think he's tripping off these cards, and I certainly don't think he's dumb enough or whatever he said. He was confused, or I got to take better care of my cards, or I traveled with my cards. Please. The guy could recite the playbook frontwards and backwards. What was they, 10 and 6 or 12 and 4 last year? I don't care how good the offensive line is. This is, you know, 
I don't, I don't care how good the offensive line is or the other players are. Or they got lucky in this game or this happened. You know, the guy's probably a, a decent quarterback, at least for a year he was. That's not easy to do. Not everybody can do that. And uh, he's certainly not a dumb guy. So just wanted to reiterate that. That wasn't something I just threw out willy-nilly or heard from one person or heard from two people. I wouldn't say something like that if it wasn't uh, kind of backed up and verified. At least something of that magnitude. You know, the stuff that doesn't have that, that isn't a, a you know, huge national story. Like, the you know, the freaking USA Today and the Washington Post and Deadspin and ESPN all had stories on this. Are you kidding? So I'm not going to throw out something willy-nilly that isn't uh, backed up from uh, people that I certainly would trust. But that's it. Hour in. Ooh, we got to cut this off. We're over an hour in. See you later. Hope you enjoyed it. And we'll be back. Hopefully the NFL season doesn't tank me. And maybe I'll come back on a Sunday or Monday. Um, Sunday nights, which are good times to record this. So peace out. Hope you're doing good. And uh, think about uh, buying some cards because maybe they'll just keep going up.